Hey, I'm Jesse. Let's have a devotion. We are in Exodus chapter 22. We're going to look at verses 16 through 27, and we're going to get some context from the book of Genesis and to help shed light on what's behind these additional laws that God is prescribing for Old Testament Israel based on a practice that was pervasive throughout the ancient world, but that makes no sense to modern American ears without context. So this is our passage we're really going to study today, but first I just want to give you some background. Uh, Jacob, you know, uh, the trickster got tricked by his father-in-law Laban, and now he's married to both Rachel and her sister Leah. And the two of them have a conversation, Genesis 31, 14 through 15. Rachel and Leah answered him, Do we have any portion or inheritance in our father's family? Are we not regarded by him as outsiders? For he has sold us and has certainly spent our purchase price. Rachel and Leah expected to get some of the money that was paid in order for them to be able to marry Jacob. Then in the defiling of Dinah, one of the most shocking stories in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 34, uh, this plea is made, demand of me a high compensation and gift. I'll give you whatever you ask me. Just give the girl to be my wife. This was a common practice in the ancient world in which, you know, this husband would pay whatever it took to be able to marry this woman. And then that money would make its way to her as part of her inheritance, perhaps, if you can kind of extract that from what Rachel and Leah are saying. So it was a common practice. Exodus 22 is going to build on that common practice. Here's Exodus 22, verse 16. If a man seduces a virgin who is not engaged and he sleeps with her, he must certainly pay the bridal price for her to be his wife. If her father absolutely refuses to give her to him, he must pay an amount in silver equal to the bridal price for virgins. So it's expected when in ancient Israel, uh, if you had sex outside of marriage, guess what, bub? You're married now. You're going you're gonna to do right by her, and you are going to pay the full price to her father, which she will inherit, and she's now going to have all the full rights of a wife, which means that now you're going to provide for her and you can protect her. You're going to take care of her for life. Uh, this idea of a bridal price is what kind of mixes this up because it suggests that the wives are property. But we could see based on Rachel and Leah's com uh, conversation that actually at some point she would receive this money. They expected to. And that's different from purchasing property. That's a fundamentally different thing. And moreover, within the biblical view of marriage, uh, you know, you give yourself up for your wife and you provide for her and you protect her forevermore. Uh, I, I found an interesting Facebook group called uh, They're Rediscovering Christian Morality. And it's remarkable. It just shows like posts from the atheistic community and the secular world uh, where people are making moral judgments that end up having the horseshoe effect, where they come right back around saying, you know what, I think we'd rather have this idea. And this idea is a biblical principle or a biblical precedent at play. And this is one of those things. As... You know, the, the, as sleeping around, you know, uh, has been prevalent for, for many, many years. Uh, there, are, there are women out there who are starting to realize like, wait, this is not good. This doesn't work out well for women, especially, especially does not work out well for women. And there was one, uh, there was one like uh, group of feminists who came together in some sort of conference and they arrived at what they thought was a novel idea. And it was this idea that uh, if a man gets a woman pregnant or sleeps with a woman, that he is to take care of her for life. And uh, the, this, this, this Facebook group, they're rediscovering Christian morality, was like, there's a word for that, isn't there? What is that called again? Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> like, isn't that exactly the way that, isn't that exactly the, the way that the Bible prescribed that things should be done in Old Testament Israel? Isn't that why we as Christian men and women both try to save our virginities until marriage, right? So that, you know, when you're intimate with someone, it's because you're married, you're married. And then go figure when you follow the, the only recipe that leads to the creation of babies, and then lo and behold, a baby is born, uh, that baby's born into a covenant relationship before God, 
uh, where that baby's need is going to be met by his father who's present. Her needs are going to be met by her father who is present. And that, that mom's going to be taken care of for life. Okay, this is sometimes uh, misrepresented in secular thought and feminism as a form of misogyny. The thought that like no wife of mine is ever going to work. Uh, rather, uh, in reality, that might be some ancient trope. I don't know. In reality, I can speak from my own marriage. From our first date, my wife and I weren't dating just a date. We were both trying to answer the question like, are we marriage material? And if we're not, we're out of here. Let's not waste time. We sat down at the Fish House, probably the nicest restaurant in Pensacola. And uh, we got right to it because on the, the very first date, I just lo said, look, I'm not dating just a date. I'm trying to see if I I'm, I'm looking for my wife. And if that freaks you out, we can just go home now. It's no big deal. And she said, oh, thank God. I've been so tired of these men wasting my time. Okay. So take note of that. Uh, young single men, um, you know, a lot of Christian women are tired of Christian men just wasting their time. Okay, if you get friend zoned, it's because you're being duplicitous, frankly. You're not being forthright from day one with your intentions. When I asked my wife for her number, I even my first words were, I don't want to be your friend. My intentions are exclusively romantic. I want to take you on a real date. What's your number? That was how I asked my wife on our first date. And so we got right to work on that first date and we began to talk about this stuff. We began to talk about each other's expectations and each other's backgrounds because much of your family of origin kind of shapes what you're going to uh, expect in marriage one day. And you got to be willing to understand like, okay, my background may be different than what's normal, <laughs> you know, or my background is definitely different from, from her background, but that background is shaping her expectations. And so we came together and talked about this and, uh, you know, there is no legal requirement that says that a wife is not supposed to work. If you've heard that within Christianity, that's not biblical. Look at the Proverbs 31 woman who, while her husband is off at work, she's wheeling and dealing with real estate. She's planting vineyards and she's making profits off of it and she's selling clothing. I mean, like there is an Old Testament precedent for this, but what's what, but the, the buck stops here, according to Ephesians 5, where it's, it's my job as the husband in my marriage, right, to see to it that my wife is taken care of. And so I knew this biblically on that date at the fish house. And I said, Look, I'm not, I'm not one of those guys who's like, no wife of mine is going to work. But what I do understand is that that's my job. And so my hope is in my future marriage one day that we'd shape our monthly budget. Oh, you'd be amazed how simple finances become when you just break it down per month, our monthly budget, all of our expenses are covered by my salary. And whatever we earn, we tithe and we give beyond that, perhaps, you know, whatever God lays in our hearts, we save. Uh, back then, you could afford to save 10% of your income and give 10% of your income and live off of 80. Uh, it's becoming increasingly difficult in Bidenomics and with inflation. Um, but that was my offer was like, look, you don't have to work if you don't want to. Uh, but I'm not going to put some sort of moratorium on work here. And at the time, I had a couple of jobs going simultaneously. I'd started a small business, and I was a full-time youth pastor, <clears throat> and, and God was good. And we did exactly what we anticipated. We shaped our budget around my income alone. Jessie, that's my wife's name, also worked. And then her income was just fun money. You know, we would go on cruises, or we'd buy little things that we needed here and there. And, and we weren't dependent upon it. We would tithe from it. But we didn't shape our monthly budget on it and we didn't elevate our lifestyle this is critical in such a way that we were financially dependent on her income because again from date one we had talked about kids and so a year and a half into our marriage austin is born and it was not a financial crisis because we didn't buy more home than we could afford and we didn't have car payments um, we had cool cars. I had a Mustang GT. She had a Chrysler Crossfire. Those were pretty rad. Uh, they also both eventually had to go because Austin's siblings came with rapid succession. Uh, but, you know, we weren't overextended. We weren't living beyond our means. Uh, we were we were debt free and uh, I paid off her tuition, um, paid off the tiny student loan that I had taken out at one point for like a few grand, uh, paid off. I paid off her car for her. 
Um, she, she came under my insurance, which by the way, was terrible insurance. We had to pay like 12 grand for Austin. <laughs> I wondered if they would take them back if we didn't pay it, but I covered all of her needs and everything was shaped around my income. And then when she had to leave the workforce, uh, she did. And by the way, she didn't have to leave school either. She was, she was still working on her bachelor's degree when we got married. Uh, she was told by her teachers, you need to just drop out of school. She made the Dean's list. She got pregnant. She was told you just need to take the semester off. She made the Dean's list again. In fact, she was taking an exam on a laptop on top of her, uh, <clears throat> pregnant belly, uh, while being induced into labor, she was typing on this laptop and she made an A on that exam between contractions. Okay. That is superwoman right there. So her tuition was paid. She made the Dean's list. She was able to step away from her job without crisis. I had all of her benefits covered and I didn't make that much money, by the way. My salary at the church back then was 32 grand a year. Um, and then I had another small business teaching and uh, teaching drums and, and writing music. And I think at its best year, it made 40 grand. Um, and so we were doing pretty well, even though my usual regular dependable salary was like beans today. Okay. 32 grand a year puts you <laughs> like 70 something grand below the poverty line here near Seattle, but we were debt free and we lived above our means, had a brand new house that smelled like paint. It was just tiny. And so there was never any pressure on her to work. And now after like 13 or 14 years out of the workforce, when our baby girl, Autumn Grace started kindergarten, she said, you know, I think I want to go back to work. And so we did. And it's, it's been fun, you know, it's been good. And she's quickly rising up the ladder. And I, I, I said, I bet you're going to be CFO pretty quick. <laughs> and so that's the deal. Jesse and I were both virgins when we got married. I did, she didn't just save herself for me. It wasn't as though I paid some sort of virgin price. I was a virgin too. Okay. I had to fight to keep my purity through years at FSU and tour and everything too. And when we got married, we were both virgins. This is, this is always left out of feminist critiques of Christianity and even the Judeo-Christian view about virginity, for example. Um, so, you know, when I met with her dad to ask for his permission, I assured him, uh, your daughter's going to be very well taken care of. Now look at this in verse 18. Don't allow a sorceress to live. Whoa, man. <laughs> it doesn't even say they must be put to death. That's implicit within the, 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 the stipulation. Don't let them live. All right, you got a sore spot among the people of the Exodus uh, for sorceresses because we saw, we saw their futility and even additionally destructive effects in, during the Exodus. Whoever has sexual intercourse with an animal must be put to death. And it's not just because it's an abomination according to Leviticus 18. It's also because these practices were common in animal worship. Some of the, I mean, backwards pagan nations that surrounded them would do this stuff. Verse 20, whoever sacrifices to any gods except the Lord alone is to be set apart for destruction. So these three are capital offenses. And now you have a bunch of laws that are quite gracious in nature. Here's verse 21. You must not exploit a resident alien or oppress him since you were resident aliens in the land of Egypt. Okay, you remember what it was like for you? Don't do that to them. You must not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. Okay, does that hearken to James in the New Testament? True religion? If you do mistreat them, they will no doubt cry to me and I will certainly hear their cry. My anger will burn and I will kill you with the sword. Then your wives will be widows and your children fatherless. Once again, we see God is now stepping in to his own sense of jurisprudence. He is guaranteeing that the laws are carried out. If you lend silver to my people, to the poor person among you, you must not be like a creditor to him. You must not charge him interest. So this, this cut out the possibility of bookies in the Old Testament, didn't it? If you ever take your neighbor's cloak as collateral, return it to him before sunset, for it is his only covering. It is the clothing for his body. What will he sleep in? And if he cries out to me, I will listen, because I am gracious. 
So I know that the, the concept of theonomy is very fascinating. When I was going through for my doctorate, there was another guy whose whole dissertation was on uh, this experimental governmental model of theonomy that draws upon the laws of the Old Testament for the laws of a, uh, the laws of a, of a society today. And here's one of the problems with that is that God had told Old Testament Israel, I will intervene and I will see to it that this is done. But according to Romans 13, that power of arbitration now is given by God to the government. And so it's going to, it makes a lot of assumptions that God would do this again today. So God is the God of justice. Everything is just better his way. Watch for this tendency out there in culture as people will end up in the horseshoe effect, rejecting God, rejecting his word, seeing what it's like without God, and then intervening, and then calling out for something that ends up looking a lot like the word of God on the other side. Okay, go out and spot some horseshoes because they are indeed rediscovering godly morality out there.